Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here's what I want to do right in the beginning. Let's read it. So follow me and let me read verses 11 through 16. The final six verses of this chapter go like this. Timothy, command and teach these things. By the way, you talked about imperatives. There are 10 imperatives in this section of scripture. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Very unusual. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Whoa, the way God words that. So on Tuesday this past, I went up to Prescott Christian Church up on Senator Highway and uh, had lunch and had a nice meeting with 10, 12 other senior pastors from the community. There was uh, Matt from Solid Rock. We've actually had him teach here before. Uh, there was like John from Union Church, John from the Heights. There was Jason from Prescott Christian. Oh, really cool guys. Really loved Jesus. And we were able to encourage each other. Um, we found out how much common vision we have as God takes us forward in our community that is growing like wildfire, man. It is expanding. God has a place for all of us. And in the future, we're definitely going to connect with them and, and do ministry and, you know, be the, alongside brothers and sisters. It's, it's going to be amazing. So uh, let's see. Oh, I have another picture for you as well. I just wanted you to see that, you know, I actually can handle babies. That's just a, a sweet little baby. Okay, you guys, that was for me. You can take that picture down. <laughs> so, so, um, we, we get to talking and found out some interesting, common issues that we face in church. And one of them happens to be this that we're all facing a shortage of servants. That there is a lot of church need. Basically, here's what's going on in our community. The churches that are focused on the Bible, on teaching the Bible and living out the Bible, we are all growing. And we are all growing, and that means greater and more needs for servants. To fill. And though it's not a huge need for any of us, it's not a huge problem for, for us, it is an issue for all of us. And so as I was praying about it, coming down the hill and thinking, you know, Lord, why, what? I realized a key reason. And that's because there are some people who come to church who don't really have a strong walk with Jesus. They, they, they're missing that daily intimacy, that connection with Jesus that we're all really called to have. You know, we're, we're immersed in the Bible and prayer. Occasionally you take your coffee, you know that? that kind of interaction with the Lord. And that's the relationship God wants of every single one of us. And you know, I'm concerned. We're concerned. Because what they're practicing is cultural Christianity. It's more modeled on culture than on Christ. It's, you know, it's about what can God and church do to fulfill my needs rather than the flip side, which is the biblical side, how can I plug in to be an essential part of the body, lending myself sacrificially 
so that Jesus is glorified and the church remains a light on a hill. This is the call, but this is unfortunately part of a trend. They, they read their, don't get me wrong, they read their Bibles sometimes. They say their prayers occasionally or maybe even every day, but it's more about the meal than anything else. Or when it is a prayer, it's a request. And not so often praise and worship and communion. The close connection, you know, you know that vital lifeline that Jesus is supposed to be? He's like our vital heavenly lifeline for a prosperous earthly existence. Mm -mm. You see it, and, and maybe you've heard the term consumer. And, and basically, they find a church, and it's good, and it meets the needs, and, and they like it. But, you know, as soon as a need doesn't get met, conflict is, you know, they face some kind of conflict. They say, thank God there's 40 other churches in our community. I'm going to go find one. And they go and they, they look for a better store to buy from. That's really, a, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, it shouldn't, it really shouldn't be. I'm, I believe they're saved. I, I, I believe that they know Jesus and they will be in heaven with him someday. But their Christian life is all consumed with self rather than all consumed with Christ. You know, they serve sometimes. Don't, don't get me wrong there either. They will serve sometimes. But the purpose of the service is more about meeting some, again, some personal need. Often I will find that it's kind of a guilt thing. You know, I haven't, I haven't stacked chairs in 14 months. I guess I'll, I'll stack chairs tonight. And it's kind of a done, done deal. Listen, if I'm describing you right now, if that's you, I want you to know I love you, but I also want to tell you that you are not living the life of a Christ follower. You are not living out the call of the Christian life. You know, the Christian life is about putting Jesus first. It's about putting others and the church next. And it's about putting yourself dead last. <laughs> I mean, last is you can't even see how far back you are kind of last. Jesus told his disciples this. Look, this is the New Living Translation, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, the cross was not a piece of jewelry that they wore on their necklace. The, the little chain, you know, they didn't hook it up to that. This was about complete self-denial. The Christian life is about renouncing ourselves, knowing that we are not our own. Why? How come? Because we were bought and paid for by Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, huh? verse 15, isn't this one of the most amazing things? And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, mm -mm, but for him who died for them, uh, who died for them and was raised again. See, ministry isn't volunteering for Jesus. It's not just filling in a gap that you know is temporary. It's not that at all. Ministry is identity. Work is what you are. A worker is what you are in Christ. You bought me, Jesus, I'm yours. You're my master, I'm your slave. Have your way. And as you walk with him, beloved, listen, as you walk with him in that mindset, your attitude is, it, it changes. That is a most satisfying life, isn't it? Isn't it to give your life to the Lord and let him lead you? To, to take what he has and use it for his glory? You bet. It is the coolest thing. I'm going to give you a summary of how I look at verses 11 through 16, and I want you please to write this down, okay? This, your walk. I just described your walk. That means 
personal, intimate relationship with Christ himself, okay? Your walk with the Lord then, then, becomes the foundation of your work for the Lord. If you interact with Jesus like he is truly your Savior and your Lord, volunteering will not be something you do. It will be a way of life. Serving will be something that you just hunger to do. You're, you're, you're going to come because we do have these people in the church. They come to us here in the sanctuary or at the front office and they say, hey, is there something else that the church has need of? Hey, Raj, what do you need? Is there something going on as far as, you know, pastoring or shepherding that I can fill in? We have a lot of those people at this church. And you can tell why, you guys, because they're walk first. Priority number one. And that simply flowed over into being a worker. You have to be with the Lord before you can work for the Lord. That's kind of it. You're God's children. Man, I want to be with my dad. I, <laughs> praise the Lord, my dad's with Jesus. But, but you know what I'm saying? My father, I want to be hand in hand with my father. And, and then he says, Raj, go do this and go do that. I'm like, yes, daddy. That's, that's it. How about this one? I think I just wrote this out so you didn't have to, but Jesus always calls us to himself before he calls us to a task. Doesn't that sound biblical? That sounds right. It's your walk followed by your work. That's the gist. That's the message here. Now, there is going to be one third element that I'm going to explain. It's your walk which leads to your work but you don't work in and of yourselves. Praise God, he has empowered you with what are called gifts. So it's your walk leading to your work, but you're equipped to do the work. And that's, the, that's gonna be the pattern that Paul is gonna follow as he speaks to Timothy. In fact, let me give you a little background there. So Timothy is, remember, young Pastor Timothy, and he's leading, he's shepherding and teaching the church in Ephesus. And what we, what we see based on the text is that he's facing opposition. We know that there were false teachers. Do you remember we talked about that? Part of a shepherd, a pastor, a pastor teacher's responsibility is to protect the flock from false teachers. And Paul put it in there. Hey man, you got to know them, you got to recognize them, and you got to get them out of there. And then you got to equip your people so that they can recognize them. They'll know to stand up to them and say, get out. We're not following you. And, and, and other things. Uh, those imperatives, those present active imperatives, you know, here's what you do. Here's what you do. Do it now. Do it now. There's 10. And, and, and he's talking about it. Uh, beware false teachers. Uh, be nourished in God's word. Be obedient to God. Avoid ungodly teaching. Practice spiritual discipline. Put your hope in the Lord. And on and on the list goes. You see, this is Timothy's work. And the reason why T uh, Paul could tell Timothy to do the work is because Timothy, Timothy has a walk. Paul has already acknowledged this young man. Dude, way to go with Jesus. Like, you're in it. Now, I want to see it come out this way. Timothy has a walk. Timothy's got the work. Here was the problem. He got timid, timid Timothy. It seems that Timothy sort of caved in to some of the pressure. Timothy, we're going to see this in just a minute. Timothy was a young man. That means he was in his 30s. And a man, religious leader in those days, usually 40s, 50s, and beyond, if you were a 30-something-year-old in a pulpit and people, like, didn't really like you, they would, they would insult you. they dude, kid, get out of there. They would go to other people in the church and say, don't you even listen to that guy. What is, what is he? Huh? Is he fresh out of elementary school? You know, <laughs> who is this guy? And apparently, so he faced the false teachers, he faced the critics, and it seems like he didn't accomplish the work. 
So let's go back to the formula, formula, so to speak. He had a good walk, but where was the work? And Paul's going to say, dude, you have a gift. You've been equipped. Utilize that, and you are good to go. Look at verse 11 again, and then we're going to pray. Command and teach these things. Work, Timothy. Do what you got to do. Again, it's all those imperative things, and we'll explain them in just a minute, but do them because there's something going on, okay? So that's the intro, command and do, or command and teach. You got the work because you have the walk, but wait a minute, you're not doing the work. And then he goes into verses 12 through 16, and that's where we get that meat, okay? Let's, let's pray. We haven't prayed yet, and then we're gonna go forward and see how this applies to you and me, because it does. Lord, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the encouragement that it always gives. And the exhortation, Lord, how you push us with it. And we just want to be yielded. We want to be submissive. We want to be servants of the Most High God. We pray, though, now, as we take in your word, please nourish us. Holy Spirit, prepare each and every one of our hearts to hear the word, to learn the word, and to do the word. May you be glorified in all of that. And Lord, if you've brought anybody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, we lift them up to you and ask, today, would you save them? Today, may it be the day of their salvation. And we pray all of this by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. He's got the walk. He's called to the work. He's timid. Look, let no one despise you for your youth. That is the present imperative. What that means is, Timothy, Timothy, each and every moment, you are going to face opposition in your church. You have to stay on top of it. Fight it. Don't just put up with it or walk away with it. He says, let no one despise you. You know what pastors are called to do? You guys, we're called to watch, to shepherd. And when we see some kind of sin or conflict or issue rise up in the church, the Bible tells us we have to proactively go after it. If we see sin, you know, one of the guys, one of the elders, one of the pastors, we go and we say, hey, what, what's going on here? Is everything okay? And we have to confront and we have to be active with it. Let no one means you're working to let no one. As soon as he saw somebody despise or go, you kid, no, I'm not listening. He's supposed to go up to him and say, sir, I need to talk to you right now. And take him aside. You guys, when you're, when you're acting in the righteousness of the word, when you have the heart of Christ with you, it's okay to confront error. It's okay to confront sin. You're not trying to win. You're trying to see that that person is convicted righteously so that they'll then turn to the Lord and say, ah, forgive me, and they'll walk in holiness, okay? That's the call of a Christian. We can do it. We do have to check our pride, though, at the door. So here are these troublemakers. Paul says, don't even put up with them. They think you're young. By the way, speaking of young, how old was Jesus, they say, when he started his ministry? Remember, about 30? How long did his ministry go for? About three years? Jesus Christ? Did his entire ministry from age 30 to 33, uh, he was considered young. You know, <laughs> the disciples before Jesus ascends into heaven and he goes, let me give you my great commission, you know, go, go into all the world, share my gospel, make disciples. Probably every one of them in his early 20s, some make the argument that they were actually teenagers. Now I've looked and you could be, but, the point is, they were very young. Hmm, that's how God launched his church? That's who God called to be the authors of his word? Yeah, Spurgeon, um, you know, Calvin, Billy Graham. They all started their, their ministries young. You know what the point is in all that, you guys? Is that age doesn't determine your ability. Character does. Character, not age. Son, Timothy, don't you let them despise you because you're 30-something? In fact, and this is where he goes now, he's going to say, 
Let them see your character. Check it out. But set the believers an example. Again, that's that present imperative. That means do it always. Do it now and do it forever. Always be an example. Let your character define you. And that'll allow you, that'll establish you in your work, man. You've already got a relationship with Jesus. You know, the kind of this character thing, to me, it's a bridge from walk to work. Okay, that's the way in my mind I sort of picture it. It's like a bridge from walk to work. But let's look at the elements, okay? Let's look. Older versions have six elements. Newer versions have five. Um, spirit is the one. You got some of the older manuscripts don't have that. Okay, so speech. <laughs> Question, as I'm convicted because I read James. Uh, has your tongue been tamed by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> because you cannot tame your tongue without the power of God, the Bible says. The Bible says that we can tame every reptile, every beast, every bird, every sea creature, but we cannot tame our tongues. Yikes. That little thing in there. Yikes. You know, uh, here's the truth, you guys. Christians have to be so conscientious of this. That what comes from your mouth, where does it originate? In your heart. You know who lives in your heart, Christian? The Lord. Hey, you are the temple of the living God. It says this represents this. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Talk about having to tame this guy. Do not let any unwholesome. Paul talks to the Ephesian church. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Helpful, benefit, edifying. Does that describe your tongue this week? God says, that's, Raj, how I want you to talk. God says, remember, I'm in you, my son and daughter, so I want your words to represent that fact. Yeah, Jesus was always so mindful of what he said. Stayed away from, you know, the ridicule, the little put-downs, the, the sarcasm that has the little put-downs built into them. No gossip, no bitterness. Of course, you know, no swearing, no dirty jokes, things like that. Not condescending. <laughs> Never complain. Oh, boy. You guys... Don't be complainers, okay? No complainers in the Christian church. I, I was at the um, DMV on Thursday. Oh, my goodness. One of my kids got his license. Jackson got his license. So pray for us, okay? <laughs> Ministry is stressful enough. <laughs> so anyway, that is like, man, that is a place for complaints just to boil over. So I'm standing there in line, and this guy next to me, he just looks at me, and he's shaking his head, and he's like, I can't believe how long they take in here. Do those guys even know what they're doing? And, you know, he's, ex because generally speaking, people will kind of just agree. I thought, oh, Lord, I can't, I can't go with that. I can't let that guy go. And so I was just like, right, seriously, huh? No kidding. Because... I have watched them as they've been working. Every one of them seems to be smiling and they're helping the people. I just saw him write out the form for that lady. And, and uh, you know, some of them were joking. Two people have already asked us if we have been helped. Uh, I told them about Jackson's uh, driving instructor or, or tester, driving te drive tester. And he was a really cool guy. <laughs> he actually, when he told Jackson to park the car, he said to him, well, I've seen better, but that was good. I thought, <laughs> yes. He's not one of those dudes who gives trophies as participant. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got to earn it. And, and 
what does the guy, he just kind of stares at me for a minute and then looks away. I wasn't ready for me to say those things there. But you guys, that's what we do. That's how you do it. And I know in the flesh, it's so tempting to agree. You're so tempting to say, well, I do have this one little thing about him that I wanted to talk to you about. Be careful, because the Bible says go to him rather than talk about it with her. Believers, this is it. Don't be harsh. Don't be mean. Nothing untrue coming from you. You know, Jesus actually said, when people ridicule you, and go after you, you know, because you're a Christian. He says, don't, don't return evil for evil. Don't revile when you're being reviled. He goes, here's what's going to happen. You are going to amass rewards in heaven. Now, is that incentive or what? You are going to amass rewards in heaven when you just realize that you're rubber and they're glue and anything they say bounces off of, <laughs> bounces off of, oh yeah, bounces off of me and sticks to you. Huh. Did you know that's in the Bible somewhere? It is. <laughs> oh. How about correcting somebody? Huh? Remember what I said? You have to confront. Sometimes it's just a brother or sister who's kind of a little wayward. What about that? Well, Jesus says it like this. Make sure the log in your eye has been dealt with. Then go for it. Tell them about the little sp- splinter that's in their eye. It's a good thing, you guys, to come alongside and confront. But you have to be careful to practice biblical con- confrontation. Uh, <laughs> here's one more I just couldn't, I couldn't pass up. James 1.19, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Let's face it, there are people who you sit with, and I hope I'm not describing you, who basically talk and talk and talk and then talk a little more. I I have this image in my head when I talk to people. There's this image. It's like a pie chart. And in my mind, it's, it's, uh, it's recording time spoken by each person. And there are some people when I have a meeting with them, I have a pie slice like that big, and they have the rest of the pie that they've been speaking in. I think 50-50 is good. And so we have to be very quick to listen and slow to hear to truly find out. You notice that Jesus was a really good listener? He's really good. Jesus did the weirdest thing. He listened to tax collectors. He listened to sinners. He listened to the outcasts who needed to be healed. Come on, come to me. What? What is it, kids? Jesus was a listener, man. Yeah, he spoke well, but he also listened. Let's model ourselves after him, okay? So that's speech. That's, that's the tongue. That's what we're called then first as far as our walk to our work. Let's keep going. We have a few more here. How about our conduct? What is our conduct? Well, it goes like this. First the talk, then the walk. Right? Your tongue is the talk. Your conduct is your walk. It's your lifestyle. How do you carry yourself? How are you living? It's it's about what you do with your time. It's about what you do with your money. When's the last time you bought a big ticket item and Jesus was in the middle of it somehow? What about that, that big vacation where you've set aside a lot of time? Because you need to go relax or rest or do whatever. Where is Jesus in that mix? These are, the, these are the kinds of things that define our conduct. They are very. Remember how I started this, you guys? It's all about him first and ourselves last. The Christian perspective on saving a lot of money isn't so that you can buy the greatest car at retirement. The Christian perspective on retirement with an, a large amount of money is because I want to use it for the kingdom. That is, man, that flies in the face of what they say in the world. Integrity. How about when a boss assigns you to a task? Like, do you just kind of get away with the minimum? Or are you doing it with excellence? Because you're doing it for Jesus. That's conduct. 
I, I think Christians should smile a lot. I think we should have a little bounce in our step when you're walking through whatever, coals or sprouts or I don't know where we even go. I try to stay away from the stores. Wait a minute, is that good conduct for me to stay away from the stores? No, but seriously, going somewhere, just have a little, I don't know, a little joy that shows. All of it is conduct. And it reflects, what is it reflecting, by the way? It reflects the walk, which spills over into the work. Let's keep going. Love. Now, this isn't that kind of emotional, goopy stuff. This is the agape. This is that love that says, none of me and all of you. It's the love that defined Jesus while he was on the cross. It is self-sacrificial. It seeks your highest good. You guys, when you can partake of something that draws another Christian closer to the Lord, man, your act, that is agape. That is sacrificial love that you want to get in the middle of. When you can draw another believer to more intimacy with God, when you can draw them to understanding the word more, I don't know, you know, life groups are a great opportunity for agape, for self-sacrificial love. But this is, what, this is what's called for when you have a walk with the model of that kind of love. First, First Corinthians 13, every two months, read it. Keep the love list fresh in your mind, okay? Every couple of months, just go right back through it. Be patient and kind in demonstrating your love. Don't be rude or resentful in demonstrating your love. Bear all things in demonstrating your love. You know, hope all things, endure all things. Boy, when Christians do that, look out, work. Because you're going to do it for the Lord. How about faith? Faith. The original word there that Paul uses, I would say a dual, fair to say dual meaning. Firstly, faith would mean faithfulness. Okay, you're reliable, which happens to be a fruit of the Spirit, right? Like reliability. You're trustworthy. But then there's this second one that I really want to exhort you to, okay? Encourage you to. And that is faith called trust. That is simply put, trusting in God. You're even keeled in life, whether on a mountain or in a valley, you are even keeled. You know why? Because your trust never wanes. You just go, God's in control. It is the will of God, and he has called me to go through this for a season as this. And so, Lord, you're in, you, my life is yours. And you notice those people. You ask them about their life, and they're like, yeah, you know, I just got diagnosed last month. And I don't know, it doesn't look good. But hey, let me take you out for some coffee. Let's talk about your walk with Jesus. That's, that's faith. That comes from being close with Christ, okay? That's walk that spills over into work. What else? Purity. He says purity. Hmm. Staying pure. This one would be outward and inward. They had the temple of Diana above Ephesus. They say a thousand temple prostitutes descend upon the city every night. Talk about temptation. Talk about steering away from purity. Yeah, that was it. And then you guys, nowadays, what about it? What do we have available to us? You have all of that lewd stuff online. You have all the, the things that absolutely, oh, are, are an insult, are, are just offensive to Christ. And these sorts of things, they start in your thought life. They start right up here. We have to, the Bible says, take those thoughts captive. When any sort of evil or impurity does start to invade your mind, the first thing you do is you take it captive. In other words, you take it before Christ. I recognize that this sin is coming, Lord. And by your power, I repent. I ask you to take it from me. And make me like you. Keep me pure. Protect me from these things. It's a, it's a battle. It's, it's a battle back then. It's a battle today. But it's something that is so important to maintain in order to keep your walk with Christ 
tight. And then that spills over into your work. Uh, by the way, for me, Romans 13, verse 14, put on Jesus Christ and don't think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. That's a key verse. Lord, I'm freezing in the temptation of this sin. I need the jacket of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like that. You just got to keep reaching for him and putting him on. So, so those are the five characteristics. You go through the Bible and there's 55 characteristics. But the Holy Spirit led Paul to talk about these ones here. Walk, then work. Walk serves as foundation, then work serves as, you know, practical application. So every Christian commanded to work, every one of us. You know what you have to do? You have to take these Pray over them, okay? Do it tomorrow. Do it tonight. Have discussions with people. I have in your life group notes there, you're going to talk about some stuff. But it's important because then step two comes, and that is the walk. Here, the next verses all go together. So let's check this out, okay? So Paul tells Timothy, now do your work. And by the way, verse 16, would you sneak a glance at verse 16? Pay attention to yourself. Walk. And on the teaching work. You see that? He's got that in order right there. Check out yourself with Jesus, then go work for Jesus. And it's interesting here, verse 14 tells us that he could do that because teaching was his spiritual gift. Remember I said you, you'll be equipped for it? So keep that in your mind. Verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture to exhortation, to teaching. Now, there is our model for church. There it is. We surround. Everything is centered around the Bible. Our church, this church, those churches, those guys that I was showing you on the screen, what we have done is made sure to keep the Bible the central thing. Notice what Paul says to do. He says, take the scripture and read it. Right? Every time we start a study, we check out the scriptures and read it. And then skip exhortation because it actually makes sense in the, in the logical order here. We teach it. Timothy, you've got the gift to teach, do it. We teach it. We exegete the scripture. That means we take from the scripture the meaning to understand it. We don't do what's called the eisegete, which is to plug in our own meaning and say, you know, this is what it matters. I mean, this is what, what it means. And then once we get it, we exhort. Exhort means apply it. We go live it. That's the way we want. Every time I start a prayer for our services, I say, Lord, give us the meaning and then give us wisdom to go do it. So here's the model right here. And he says, dude, Timothy, come on now. You're the man. And this is what your calling is. And by the way, God's equipped you. So go. All right not easy. The guy apparently retreated. Remember I told you? He kind of re retreated. So Paul's got to really exhort him. He goes, do not neglect it. The implication, because you have been neglecting it. Verse 15, make progress with it. Verse 16, persist in it. Persevere in it. I mean, Paul's like, son, come on. God's equipped you. Don't you let your emotions take you. Don't you get timid. You go ahead and rely on the Lord. But you guys, doesn't that show you that even when God equips us, it's not easy? Hey, you can have a tight walk, but then going into the work, it's hard sometimes. It challenges you as a man or as a woman. We get scared. We get intimidated. We like to be liked. You know, the challenge, who wants to climb up a hill when I can lay out on a beach? That's what I prefer. But he says, you can't. That's not your calling. And so I want to close us out with talking about spiritual gifts, the equipment. Remember the order. Have a walk, which spills over into work. But you can do the work because you've been equipped with the gift. And this is where he takes it. Let's talk about that for us, you guys. The gifts. 
All right, we got it. So what about the gifts? Firstly, the spiritual gift is this. First point, every believer has at least one. Every Christian has been anointed with a supernatural ability, okay? It's important to say supernatural. It's beyond you and it's beyond me. It is a God-given ability to do God's tasks. God blesses you. I, I, I gave you the references, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter um, 4. You can, you can look at those. But there are many. You could have more than one, but there are many. You know, there's teaching, there's giving, there's wisdom, there's praying, there's faith, there's mercy, and on and on and on. Because those are all needs in the church. And because he has called you to meet needs. Remember how we started this whole thing? Because he's called you to meet needs. Oh, better be based on a tight walk. But that's how. So every one of you, okay, don't say, I just am not gifted. There is something for you. Now let's go on. I'll explain it a little more. Number two, gifts are recognized, recognized by others. Now, what Paul said was, hey, son, do you remember when we laid our hands on you, the elders and us? He's talking about 15-ish years ago back in Lystra. They recognized this kid. He's got this gift. You know, it's going to be the, um, the pastor teacher. And so they laid their hands on him, and then it says, you know, he got the gift. By the way, please, it wasn't that Paul and the elders made God give the gift. It was that... God gave Paul and the elders a privilege. I'll tell you what, you guys go ahead, lay your hands on him, pray for him, and I will anoint him with the gift. Uh, but, but they didn't determine it. Okay, gifts, gifts are recognized by others, but they're gifts God gives. You don't get to order a gift. Yeah, God, I'll take teaching, a uh, side of bake, side of fries, and nothing like that. God gives. God gives when God gives. God gives what God gives. And so, so the recognition, what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is that when you live out your Christian walk, sorry, when you work, okay, when you live out your Christian walk by working, that means you plug yourself in. It means you're doing stuff. And here's how the recognition comes. You start to hear people tell you, hey, I, I really appreciate what you said because it's like I finally got it. I appreciate, you know, when you prayed, when you offered to pray for me, you should have seen what God did. First of all, in my heart, I was just transformed. And then you should have seen how God answered the prayer. And, there, and, and people will just say this with some consistency. Whatever it might be for you, they'll sort of confirm, oh yeah, well, this is what the Lord wants of me and he's given me supernatural ability to do it. When I first taught, I remember my first teaching up here being like Peter. And then Pastor Al gave me the ability to teach again. It, it was very shortly after that, and I called it being like Paul. And I remember what was cool was for weeks and months to come, yes, I was ridiculed, but also there were people who said, hey, Rod, you know when you said, and then they brought up some verse or they brought up some phrase, and it's like, are you serious? No kidding. And then the confirmation just sort of continued, realizing that then pastor teacher was the gift God has anointed me with. So I exercise it. In fact, that's the third one. Look at this one, you guys. Gifts need to be exercised and developed. You gotta, you gotta do them. Even though Timothy had the gift, he was neglecting it. And do you remember we were talking about spiritual exercise last week? Gifts are like muscle. If you don't exercise them, boop, they turn into flab. They don't do it. In 2 Timothy, he's going to say, Timothy, fan the flame. Fan into flame the gift of God. Apparently, Timothy had let the, the fire that raged turn into a little spark or something. Now, Timothy, don't do that. Exercise your gift. Man, develop your gift. Let, let, let it be, and it'll get better. You know what I'm saying? In verse 15, verses 15 and 16, Paul's like a personal trainer. 
You know, just picture in the gym and you're on the stairs or you're on the treadmill and you've got some personal trainer like, come on, you can do, don't give up. Come on, no, 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 I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to turn up the incline. Well, Paul here, he's like, he's like, practice, immerse, progress. He's like, practice this, immerse yourself in it, progress in it. That's the way you're supposed to be with your gift. Yeah, but Raj, how do I know what my gift is? Like, how do I even start? Here's, here's what I would say to people who say, well, how do I know? Okay? <laughs> do everything. I'm not even kidding. Do everything. Partake. Get yourself plugged in. See, this is the problem with people who don't put Jesus on the calendar first. You're depriving yourself of an ability to recognize a God-given ability. And you put yourself in the kids' ministry. If you can repackage Romans chapter 10 so that a five-year-old can understand it, whoo, you are gifted, baby. You know what you're doing. You, you do it everywhere. You pray with people. See what's going on with your prayers. You know, you demonstrate. You go and uh, volunteer to administer and see what happens. And I'll tell you what. You remember that confirmation thing I was telling you about? It's like some whittling goes on. You know, okay, it wasn't that. Ah, there was a little confirmation here. Oh, there was no, it wasn't that. Ooh, there's a little more confirmation here. And it sort of draws in and draws in until you get it. Do everything. Make yourself available. And listen, you guys, gifts cycle sometimes, okay? You don't, I mean, God can give and take whenever he wants. What about the gift of healing? There were some times where people laid their hands on people and those people got healed. But that individual man, like I, I've prayed and people have been healed. But I will not tell you that I have the gift of healing. I will say that at the time, God anointed me with the gift of healing. But how would I have known if I didn't pray for healing? Do everything and God will show you these things, okay? You have to exercise them. You got to develop them. It's too important, body of Christ, for us to not do it. Final, no, is this the final one? I think you got another one. Um, one. One thing I want you to know is this. Don't keep yourself exclusive to a particular gift. You know what? I don't stack chairs because I teach. Mm, I've tried it. It didn't work, okay? <laughs> no, 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 because number one, you are members of the body. And members of the body meet needs of the body. Those are general. Those are open. Remember back in Acts chapter 2, it says they sold all they had and gave. You're talking everybody sold stuff. It's because there was a need. So please don't. Here's the way I wrote it for you, okay? It kind of made sense when I put this out. We're servants first, then specific servants next. That makes sense, yeah? Your servants first, that's the broad, that's the general. And then, and then, when given the opportunity to exercise your gift, do it. We're servants first, and then we're specific servants next. And on the flip side, <laughs> make sure you do keep with your gift. I can tell you as a pastor teacher, our church is growing, business is coming up, you know, all the administrative stuff. And it can get easy to get lost in running a corporation. And, and I have to be so sensitive. Don't, because Rod, you've been called to shepherd and teach. These other guys, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, they've been awesome because they take so much of that burden away. But be careful, okay? You gotta make sure that you exercise what God has given to you. All right. Did I, um, yeah, I did skip one, so I, I want to go back to it. Be confident. Here's, here's a really important point. Hey, when you exercise your gift with an honorable walk, okay, that means your intention is godly. Your love is agape. When you exercise a gift in that context, be confident. Okay, don't you worry about those naysayers. Hey, as a teacher, somebody who, who exhorts and teaches, I get ridiculed all the time. I'm rubber. They're glue. It's like, who cares? 
I know that I've prayed over this sermon. I know I've looked up other texts. I know that I love you and only want to see you grow in Christ. So I can be confident in the words that I speak from this pulpit. This is you too. Whatever it is that you do, if that's your heart, you don't worry about the other part of it. It's just going to happen. All right, so be confident when you exercise your gift in godliness. Finally, please remember this, beloved, because this is what broke the heart of Jesus. Whenever he saw those who rejected him, his heart, his eyes always went to the eternal. He always thought about the eternal repercussions of what he did. Remember, he cries over Jerusalem. He knows these are, you're God's chosen. Do you understand what this is going to do to you? Do you understand your life, your eternity? He wept. You guys, when you exercise your gifts, firstly, the way he words, let me, please let me explain that, okay? He's not saying by, by Timothy exercising his gift, he, got, he gets saved as if it's a work. What, what I think it means more particularly is it's a demonstration that you truly are saved because a man or a woman who has a real walk with Christ will do real work for Christ. That's the bottom line. So that's, that's a demonstration of it. But then secondly was the other part. When you exercise your gift, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be used to draw people to salvation. You're going to be used to draw people out of the flames of hell and put them onto the floor of heaven. It doesn't matter. I know I'm a teacher and I get to say these things, but if your gift is praying and you pray and they see God work through your prayer, you guys, that's going to draw people. You have a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. You have some gift of helps or whatever else. They're going to say, you know, it wasn't her. You should have seen it. I saw that it wasn't really her, but it was her. And they're going to want to know why, what, how. And that's going to draw them to the gospel. It's going to draw them to the salvation message. Okay, so just remember, please, eternity. Eternal issues are at stake. Have a heart that's broken for the lost. And that will also compel you to the work. Okay, so that's, that's, I'm going to close. It's actually a pretty powerful little story, but I'm going to close with this story, okay? Thinking, walk, work, and the ability to do the work. Listen to this story. So there was a professional hockey player. Some of you know this guy, Stan Makita from the 60s, the 70s, star center for Chicago, the Blackhawks. Anyway, he was known for getting... <laughs> in a lot of fights. Um, the story goes that his eight-year-old daughter once went up to her daddy and asked a stirring question. Daddy, how can you score a goal when you're always in the penalty box? <laughs> Is, that's self-explanatory, huh, Christian? How do you do the work if you don't have a walk? How do you experience the gift if you're not even close to the gift giver? This has got to be the call for every Christian, okay? Get out of the penalty box. Have a tight walk and watch what God will do through you as you work for his glory. Oh, enjoy the gifts that are supernatural, that are beyond you and me. How fun it is to exercise what's beyond us. How amazing it is to see God do a work through these hands. How incredible it is to know that people will be saved because God decided to use me to share with them the salvation message. That's you.